few weeks ago, um, I had someone come up to me and wanted to get a hold of Candace, my wife. And they came up to me and they said, Joey, can we get Candace's number? And uh, I said, oh, wait one minute, wait one minute. And I went to go grab my phone and I, I didn't have it on me. And they said, well, it's okay. Well, you, you know her number. What's her number? Uh, I, I couldn't remember it. And, and I was embarrassed because of this. But I'm guessing most of you in here have probably run into that same situation, haven't you? Where you don't memorize numbers anymore. Why? Because we all have a smartphone that can tell us exactly what we need to know. Even, I love it because I feel smart because people will come to me, do you know this number? Give me one second. Yes, I do. And I'll look it up. But you know what? Without the phone, I know nothing when it comes to numbers or anything like that. I, I, or even addresses. Where do you live? Over there. Let me send it to you on my phone. And, and you know what? I think the reason why we have this issue is because we all have smartphones. If you think back when we all had landlines, and for those of you that are kids uh, or teenagers and have never experienced these things, you actually had to go and type the phone number in. You couldn't hit a button and it just type a number for you. You had to type the number in. But guess what? Everybody who had a landline, they knew everybody that was important to them or close to them. They knew all of their numbers. And we remembered them. And why did we remember them? One, because you had to. The other reason was because you were constantly dialing it in. And you know what? Today, during the sermon time, we're going to look at this. And for communion, I want to just briefly touch on the first part of this. But the reason why we come and take communion each week, why do we take it, is to remember. We come and take communion so that we remember what Christ did. Paul, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, explained it this way. For I received from the Lord that which I also received to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat this. It is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus told his followers in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 25, it tells us what he told them. He said, When you take this, you're remembering my body broken for you. You're remembering the sacrifice I did, but you're also remembering the new covenant that you have in my blood. And I think sometimes, if you've ever noticed, when you, when you go too long without taking communion, all of a sudden you forget to re remember the importance of what Christ did. And when we come each week, that is one of the things we're doing, is we're remembering what he did on the cross for us. And I don't know about you, but there's not many other people who are willing to die and put their life on the line and not just die for me, but die for a specific reason to save me eternally. To save my life. No one else can do that, right? Only Christ can. And we're going to remember that today. And I want you to think about that for a second. And then we will take communion together.
on that same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Lord, we come right now remembering what you did. Remembering the sacrifice you made on that cross to pay the debt for our sins. Lord, remembering what you went through, your body beaten and bruised, your blood shed for us. And Lord, I pray that as we remember, we not just remember what you did, but Lord, as we go throughout today's sermon, we remember what you've called us to in your new covenant. We thank you again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, if you are an elementary kid, you can head on back. John is teaching you. But I want to say, if you are a baptized believer of an elementary kid, I want to encourage you to stay up here. Because we're going to be talking about what communion means to us. And if you are, I I don't care if you're an adult or a little kid, if you are a, a believer in Christ and you take communion, it's important for all of us to know what Christ did. And before we get there, I, I do, we come to our time of offering prayer. And uh, I was thinking about something today, had been thinking, and I don't know about you guys, but it was hard to get out of bed this morning. Um, I got to hang out with the teenagers yesterday, last night, and um, it was a blast, but I am learning my bedtime is getting sooner and sooner. So it was, I was tired this morning. And I know talking to several of you today, several of you have said, it took everything I had to get here. I had to do a lot to get here this morning. It was tough. But you know what? As I thought through that, a lot of times we sit there and go, man, it was so rough. But also we have to thank God because he gave us the strength to be here, right? Because if it was on our own power, most of us probably would have stayed in bed and slept in. Most of us would probably not be here, but because of God's strength, and we said, God, we want to be here for you, he gave us the strength and the ability to be here today. And I want to take time, and as we come to our offering time, and thank him, as many of you have given in the plates, we also want to come and thank him for what he has given us and offer up not just our money, but our time and our focus and our hearts today. So let's go ahead and do that. Dear Lord, we come right now thanking you. Thanking you, Lord, for who you are, for what you have done, but also, Lord, thanking you for what you've given us. Lord, you've given us so much financially. You've given us so much in spiritual gifts. You have given us so many different things. And Lord, as you've given us all this, we also know you give it to us to use for your glory. And Lord, one of those things you give us is sometimes just the strength to get up and go. And Lord, as I know for some of us today, that was was the case this morning. But Lord, I want to thank you for every person that is here. That even though they may not have wanted to get out of bed, they still pushed and they still got here. We thank you for that. And Lord, as you have given us this strength, we pray, Lord, you continue to not just give us the strength, but allow us to use it in a way that honors you. Lord, I pray as we're here today, our our first thing is we want to honor you with our time, with our energy, and with our focus. We want to listen to your word, hear what you have to say. And Lord, I pray these words are not mine, but they are your words. And that as we listen to your words, Lord, that we, we, we not only hear, but we take them, apply them, and obey them so that we can live in a way that honors you and give back to you and what you've given us. Lord, also use the money that we give to glorify you 
and to bring others to know your name so they may not just know who you are, but come and be a part of you and know you personally. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we started, I told you already, we're talking about communion. Why do we take communion? And I, I've been told and asked by several people, um, okay, we get communion. We get that it's a remembrance thing. But when you talk about communion, Joey, why do we need to do it every week? Right? If you talk to them, this church doesn't do it every week. They do it every quarter. This church does it every other month. This one does it once a month. Why does our church do it every week? Is that the way you're supposed to do it? Is it supposed to be, what if, what if we did it just when we wanted to? Could we just do it on Easter? Is that when, why do we have to do communion once a week? Because, Joey, let's be honest, I, I get your cell phone may be hard to remember, but the person who died on a cross for you, that shouldn't be too hard to remember, that you have to do it every single week. And I, I, I've thought about that question a lot. And one of the things I, my mind goes to is we looked at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, but if you continue on to 26, it says this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Notice what it says, as often as. This is something that's supposed to be done on a regular basis, not sparingly. But as often, and the other part of it is, it's not just a remembrance, it's a proclamation of what Jesus did. When we take communion, we're saying, we don't just know that he did it, we believe it. And we believe it with everything. And you go, okay, but why weekly? We, we could still do it every other week. We could do, it, it gets monotonous, doesn't it, if you do it every week? Well, one of the first reasons why we do it every week is because we follow the example of the early church. And we see this in Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week when we gather together to break bread. I, I will tell you, I love that verse because of the story that follows it. Paul went on to preach all the way till midnight in that sermon, and someone fell out of the window falling asleep. Um, so those of you that fall asleep during my sermons, I only go half hour to 45 minutes. Paul went till midnight. Don't get mad at me, okay? Paul went till midnight. But do you notice that on the first day of the week when we gathered together to break bread, this was a regular occurrence that that was when they did this, the first day of the week. The other reason we do this is because if you look back in verse 23 and 20, 23 through 25 of 1 Corinthians, what Christ says, he doesn't just say to do this and remember me. What Christ says is, do this in remembrance of. All right? Now, you sit there and go, okay, potato, potato, what's the difference? Well, to remember just means to think about. Remembrance means doing something in honor of. Some of you may have a dinner that you do every year that's in remembrance of a certain person. Right? We've got different holidays that are in remembrance. We've got Veterans Day coming up. You've got um, Memorial Day. You've got President's Day. These are all in remembrance of. But it's not just supposed to be days that you stop and just say, oh, I remember them. Good. It's to cause you to think about what they did and put you into action. Each time we remember who Christ is and what he did, it should remind us to honor Christ with our actions, to put it into practice. And that is what commu why we do it every week is because we, we need reminded weekly to put into practice what Christ has taught us. And when we do this, what we're going to look at today in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 we're going to see how when we take communion weekly, what it reminds us not only of what Christ's death 
means, what his resurrection means, but it's also going to see what we are to do with it. You see, communion isn't just a remember this, it's remember to do this. Remember to follow these things. And what we're going to see in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 is we're going to see three things that we need to do and how to do them in remembrance and honor of Christ. We're going to start in Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. And it says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. First thing we have to do is we have to approach God with confidence through a new and living way. You notice the beginning of Hebrews chapter 10 teaches Jewish Christians how Jesus' sacrifice was greater than any animal sacrifice. Verses 1 through 18, that is everything he gets into is how great this sacrifice and the blood of Christ is. Not just how great, it's greater than anything else. So because of this, we confidently can be in God's presence. That therefore, you got to remember, what's the therefore, therefore? We can do this because of Christ's sacrifice. But what are we doing? What does this mean to come in God's presence? Or actually it says to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. If you don't know context, if you don't know what this all means, it can be very hard to understand, right? Again, this is written to a Jewish Christian audience. So these, the way he writes it goes back to a lot of the Old Testament stuff. Before Jesus, the Holy of Holies was a symbolic room in the temple that represented the place where God dwelled. That was the presence of God. And you see, in order to go there, there was a curtain that hung there. Now, this was not a shower curtain. This was not even just a dark out room curtain, as I wish. I wish they made these curtains, these dark out room curtains this way. This was a four inch thick curtain. All right. That is a thick, thick curtain. And actually, this is such a strong, thick curtain that they would attach horses to either side of it and have the horses pull and the curtain would not break. It would not rip. So this is a super strong curtain that nothing can break or get through unless you walk around it, right? This is supposed to represent the separation of God and man because of man's sins. That man cannot approach God because of the sins they have. Now, the catch is one day a year, called the Day of Atonement, the high, the high priest could enter in. But he had to go through and he had to be ceremonially cleaned and he had to walk in and he could go into the presence of God. He didn't get to see God, but he got to just be in the room of God's presence. And then he would do sacrifices of atonement for all of Israel. And then he would leave. But here's the catch of that. Back in Leviticus chapter 10, when they first brought in priests and high priests, Aaron was the first high priest and his sons, they decided in Leviticus chapter 10 that they were going to play with the holy fire. And they took the fire and they offered up fire that was not acceptable or not asked of by God. And when they did this, God's fire came down and consumed them and lit them up and they were gone. After that point, any priest that went into the presence of God was terrified because what they learned in that was if you didn't approach God in a holy way, if your mind wasn't right, if you went in there, then all of a sudden you could be gone. He could take you out like that, and he will. 
If you're in God's presence, you have to be holy and clean. And so what this would mean is they would, a lot of them run it, walk in with timidness and fear and would actually go through and do it as quick as possible because they wanted to get out of there. I, I don't know if any of you ever remember when you, if mom was mad, but you had to go into the room mom was in to do your chores. Maybe it was dad, but your parent was mad. You had to go into that room. What did you do? You ran in and you did the chore as quick as possible and you got out. You kept your head down. You didn't look up because nine times out of ten, the reason they were mad was because of something you had already done. Probably because you hadn't cleaned that room yet. So you would do it quickly. It's the same thing here. They would rush in quickly. But what Hebrews tells us is because of Christ, those who are in Christ and covered by his blood, they don't have to fear not being holy enough to go to God. You see, we have confidence because of Jesus' sacrifice. We have the confidence to be able to go before God and be in the presence of God. Hebrews 10, 14 tells us this, for by the one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made perfect holy. I, I, I love what he says there. He has made perfect. I think this is important for us all to know. It's when we come to Christ, it's not us who have made us perfect. It is Christ. But he has made us perfect and we are being made holy. So we can go before God in confidence. Notice in verse 20, the way we enter God's presence is new and living. No longer do we need a priest. When Christ died, we're told in Mark 15, 38, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I, I think that's a very important detail, right? Because if it's torn from the bottom to the top, what could that mean? It could have been a man that did it, right? This is 30 feet high curtain. All right, so you got to keep that in consideration. There is no man that's tall enough to climb 30 feet and be able to rip a four-inch thick curtain that horses couldn't pull apart. So the only person who could have ripped this curtain and tore it in half is God. And when Christ dies, God goes in and tears the curtain and says, the way you approach me now is new and living. You no longer have to go into the Holy of Holies. You no longer have to send someone else in for you. You can now approach me. And because now the way to God is through the resurrected Jesus who gives life, John 14, 6 tells us this, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, when we take communion, we remember when we go to God, we can go to him because we are now in Christ. But we are going through Christ. We are saved because of Christ. And as we approach God, this, this has two meanings. The most holy of places is where? It's not a temple. It's heaven, right? We can approach God, meaning we will get to be in the presence of God for eternity in heaven. But he also uses it as the present tense, as in we are now approaching God. How are we in the presence of God? Through prayer and through reading his scriptures, through taking communion, by getting together, we are in the presence of God. And we've looked at that, right? Over the last several weeks, we've looked at praying. We've looked at why we read our Bibles. We've looked at why do we go to church. We've looked at all of these things. But sometimes I think we hit a point where we lose our confidence. And I want to ask you, think about this. Do you have confidence? Do you have confidence to approach God? And, and I say that because sometimes I think we hit things in our lives where maybe it's a sin that we've done and we feel like God 
can't forgive us or we can't forgive ourselves and we feel ashamed to even go to God or we're afraid that God may may destroy us. Maybe it's because we've been so far away from God and even going to church, we're afraid if we walk in the building, he may strike us down with lightning bolts. Sometimes we say that in joking. I know people who literally think that, that if God is real, the things I've done in my life, I'm dead if I walk in that building. There are some people that really do think that. They have no confidence. Sometimes we do that. Other times it's because of everything going on in our lives and we've prayed to God and we feel like God doesn't hear us, so why am I going to come? Why am I going to listen to what he says? I, I don't have confidence that God actually cares. I don't have confidence that I even have the ability to talk to God. But when we take communion, we are reminded weekly that Christ sacrificed, has opened the door, has split the curtain, and he makes us worthy. Again, he makes us worthy so that we can confidently approach God. And this is a reminder to us to approach God. When we take communion, it should be something God's sitting there saying, have you spent time with me lately? Have you prayed with me? Have you read your Bible lately? That should be something that we're hearing when we sit down and take communion together. And hopefully our answer is yes. And when when we're doing this, we find another reason and another reminder in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. Since we have a great priest over the house of God. That's where he stops, right? Since we have a great priest of the house of God. This is another reason why we have confidence, another reason why we take communion is to assemble together in reverence under the great priest. Um, I once had a boss when I worked at Tim Hortons who was awesome. He treated us with great respect. He was very nice. He was, me and him had a lot of the same interests, so we actually started hanging out after work. I got very comfortable. I viewed him more as a friend than I did a boss. And it was great. But here was the problem. He walked in one day, and he had told me up before to clean the fryers, and I didn't do it. And he said, Emmerich, are you going to clean those fryers? And I said, yeah, right. (laughs) You're kidding. I got yelled at. I got scolded. I got punished. I was on fryer duty cleaning that for the next month because I had forgotten he was also my boss. He wasn't just my friend. He was also my boss. And you know what? I wasn't giving him the respect or the reverence or anything that was due him because I had forgotten who he was. The author of Hebrews gives us a similar reminder here. He says, Jesus is our great priest. And for us, that should be encouraging because in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, this is what we're told about this priest that we have. He says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We have a high priest, someone we can go to, Jesus, who has been where we have been. He has been tempted like we have been tempted. He has felt heartbreak. He has suffered loss of friends, loss to death of close ones. He has been through everything we have been through. We can relate to him, and he talks to God for us, and he is... This, this is perfect, right? Everything matches up. This is a great person to have in your corner, someone who you are following. What a great friend we have in Jesus, right? And it is so true. But notice the last part of verse 21. And he is over the house of God. Meaning while we can connect with Jesus, he is still over the church. 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul is talking to Timothy. 
And as he's talking to Timothy, he has been sharing with Timothy what the different leaders and different people and their wives and their children, what everyone in the church is supposed to be look like and behave, how they're supposed to behave. And he tells Timothy this, if I'm delayed, you will still know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. You see, I think when we get into communion and we get into remembering Jesus, we remember a lot of times of how much Jesus loves us. We view him as a friend. We view him as he can connect with me. He understands me. And that is all great and true. But when we get into that, we forget who Jesus is. We forget that he is still God and he is still over us. And sometimes we can lose the reverence and respect and start to just treat Jesus like we do our best friend. And here's the thing is, the Bible ever say Jesus is our best friend? No. He is like a father figure, right? There's still reverence and respect. He is still our God. He is our Savior. And in 1 Timothy 3, Paul in his instructions He tells the people to behave, and every single person, every person in leadership, their wives, their kids, the people in the church, the word he uses several times there is reverent. He has different things for each of them, but every single one of them, he tells them they need to be reverent. And you know what? I think we lose that in the church today sometimes. We lose the reverence towards God. We forget we have confidence and we come with love and and we forget who Christ is. And you may sit there and go, oh, you're talking about how you dress, Joey, aren't you? No. I mean, there is something of respect in how you dress, but that's not what I'm getting to today. I'm getting to things like if there's someone that is your boss or your parent is in the room and they're talking to you, would you sit there on your phone the whole time? Would you sit there and keep looking at your watch? What happens if you do that? You get yelled at, right? You get in trouble because you're not being reverent. If, if your boss is sitting there and talking to you and you fall asleep while your boss is talking, what happens? You get in a lot of trouble, don't you? Now, you're sitting there going, so Joey, are you saying you're the boss? No, no, I'm not saying I'm the boss. But when anyone's up here and they're reading the word of God, are we listening to the boss then? Not to that person, we're listening to God's word, right? When someone's giving communion and they're up here and we're fidgeting around, are we being reverent and respectful to God? No. We need to remember this. And one of the things to help us remember this, some of you noticed this today, and and, uh, I apologize if I pushed anyone out of their seat today, but I put something out. Someone gave me this uh, a couple weeks ago and asked me to use it in the church, and I wanted to. So you notice there's a reserved sign sitting on a pew in the back. We're going to be doing this every week, and it's going to move around. Some of you might get pushed out of your seats. You know now. But you know why. Here's why. When you have a reserved sign out, that is saying this is reserved for somebody important. This is somebody that deserves the respect that they get this seat. So what we are going to be doing is this is a reserved sign or a reserved seat for Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that's where Jesus is sitting, that Jesus is just sitting in that seat. But it's to remind us that we are making sure that when we come together, in, as a church, that we are making sure that Jesus is the most important person and that we are respecting him. And that when we see that, it reminds us that this is a time to not just joke around. We can laugh some, but this is a time to remember who Christ is. And we need to give him the respect and reverence that's due him.
And you know what? It's not just in the building. And this is why we take communion. This will remind us in the building. When we take communion, it reminds us to have that reverence all week long. To reverently live for Christ. And the other part of that is reverence means not just not looking at your watch or not falling asleep or not doing this or that. Reverence also means that you listen and obey when they tell you to do something. That you're willing to follow, and that's what leads us into 1 Peter 1.15. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Again, in and out of the church building. And this comes to our final reminder in Hebrews 10.22. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Third reason we come, third thing it reminds us to do is to draw near to God with purity of heart and mind through baptism. The author says, because of what Christ has done for us and because we can approach him and be in his presence, we need to continually draw near to him. And again, do you notice the word there, let us. So this drawing near to God isn't just an individual thing. It's everybody together. And many of you have asked in the past, um, because in the past three years, we've changed up how we do communion. Because part of it with COVID, we have everyone grab their cups ahead of time. The other reason we do this now, though, the elders and I and the deacons, we had all talked about this. And one of the things we've come to realize is communion became just a about me type of thing. And communion isn't to be an individual thing. It's to be a group family thing, a part of the family of God. And I don't know about you, but when we all take communion together... That bond, it reminds me not just of the bond I have with Christ, but how Christ binds all of us together under him so that we can all together draw near to him. Sincerely developing a deeper relationship with him. But this is where it does get personal. We do it because we love him with a sincere heart. Not doing it because we want to get something out of it. We don't draw near to God, develop a closer relationship with God, and follow Him so that we can get something. We do it because we love Him. We love Him because He first loved us. And when we do this, We take out the hypocrisy because that's one of the biggest struggles people have with Christians, isn't it? People who say, I'm a Christian, I follow and love God. And you ask them, well, why do you follow and love God? Well, because I get this and this, because of this and this. It's never because of what Christ did for me. Now, I'm not saying all Christians are like that, but when Christians say that, it's not a sincere heart. Why are you a follower of Christ? Is it because you love him? And if you do, this drawing near isn't just to dive deeper because you love God. It also means we fully trust God. If you notice there, it said, with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Assurance being we can trust him completely because of the faith we have. We trust God so much to keep his promises, to be there with us, that we are willing to leave our life of sin. We trust so much. And I will say, I love right now with my kids, we're in a moment where they've learned about trust falls. And so we keep going through and they keep asking me, Daddy, do a trust fall. Let me fall back into you. I only have one kid who really truly trusts me, I've learned. None of them are willing to completely fall back. Justice is the best. Fall back. 
That is what she does. But isn't that what we do sometimes? God says, trust me. And we say, well, I kind of trust, but I don't trust completely that you're going to forgive all my sins. So I'm not going to leave all of them. I don't trust completely this or that. So I'm not going to follow you completely. No, this love and drawing near means we are willing to follow him completely with all of our faith. And when we do this, James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, it means we have to, this drawing near means we are leaving everything else behind. We are cleaning our hands and purifying our hearts or our minds. And this leads us to the other part of this. When we take communion, drawing near to God, we're reminded of what Christ did, not just on the cross, but also what he has done and is continuing to doing when we accepted his gift. Let me explain this. Again, if you look, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, This idea, it's talking about when we first follow Christ. When we take communion, it's not just to remind us of Christ's death and resurrection. It's to remind us of the day that Christ started working in our lives, personally. It's to remind us of our personal testimony. It starts, he goes in and describes what all goes with it. It starts with needing to have a pure conscience. This pure conscience comes from our mind being set free from worrying about the punishment of sins because we believe and accept that Christ died for the forgiveness of our sins. We also need our bodies washed with water representing baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It covers all that there, right? And what I want you to notice It says, and, not one or the other, not you can do this or that, or this one is more important than this one. It says, and, that we have this confidence that we are able to go before Christ, that we are able to be saved because our minds and our bodies have been cleansed by Christ's blood and by the water of baptism. And you're sitting there going, well, it's easy to pull that from that one verse. Well, Mark 16, 16, Jesus puts it plainly. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Again, back then, today, it's everyone wants to believe but doesn't want to get baptized. Back then, everybody was willing to get baptized, but not everybody was willing to believe. The reason why this is so important, what Jesus is saying is you can't have one without the other. You can't do one or the other. You have to do both. And what communion reminds us of is the day we believed and were baptized. But not just the day we did it, not just the fact that we did it, the promise we made on that day. When your anniversary comes up, You're not just reminded that you've been married for so many years. You're not just reminded how old both of you are getting. What you're reminded is, a lot of times we sit back and remember the promise we made to each other, right? We think about what promise we made at that time when we stood there face to face and said, till death do us part. I will love you. I will take care of you through sickness and through health, through all of it. I will be there by your side. When we take communion, we remember the time when Christ came in and said, I want to save you personally. I'm going to start working on you today. And we remember the promise we made to Christ. That we were going to repent of our sins and follow him. And that we were going to make him the Lord of our life. When we take communion, we need to remember to honor Christ 
in the church and outside of the church. And as we remember the love Christ showed on the cross when he sacrificed his life for the forgiveness of our sins and to give us eternal life, I want to ask this question. Have you accepted that gift yet? Do you have confidence? Are you able to be in the presence of God because you have decided to follow Christ, that you have decided to repent, to believe, to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? If you have not made that decision yet, today you can. I also, though, want to come to those of us who are followers of Christ. And I want to ask you, why do you take communion? Are you just remembering? Or are you doing it in remembrance of him, remembering to do everything you do in a way that honors him? Remembering the promises you made to him. Remembering who he is and the promise he's made to you. To close, I want to close with Hebrews 4.16. And I think this should be, if we are all followers of Christ and we are in Christ, this should be a verse that we take to heart together. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, so that we can continue to live for Christ, pushing on in perseverance. Let us pray. Dear God, we come right now thanking you, Lord, thanking you for your love, thanking you for what Christ did on the cross for us, Lord, and, and as we come each week to take communion and remember what Christ did, we also remember, Lord, who you are. Remember what, what that death means for us, that you have opened up the Holy of Holies for us to be able to talk to you, to spend time with you, to be in your presence, and eventually, Lord, eternally to see you face to face and be with you for eternity. Lord, we look forward to that day, but until, please keep reminding us of the promise you have given us. And Lord, keep reminding us of the promise we have made to you in our baptism when we said we believe and we are ready to follow and repent and to live a life of faith to you, Lord. This new covenant we have in your blood. God, please remind us of that and help us as a church to continue to draw near to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.